thank you for joining us today again and for those of you who are watching on this you know who are going to be watching this later this is the second episode of our series on parenting adolescents and um, last week last friday we had uh, talked with anagha about uh, different aspects of parenting and today again we are going to talk about parenting but this time you're going to dive into how parenting can have a positive influence so we're going to talk about positive parenting and um, well you're you're familiar with anagha but now but still for the ones who are watching this for the first time anagha is a clinical psychologist a mother based in bangalore and uh, we're very happy to have you Thank you, Debesmita. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's always a pleasure to work with you. Thanks a lot. So let's get started. You know, I'm sure we hear the word positive parenting and positive everything so much that um, sometimes I wonder if you really understand what positive parenting even means. Right. Right. right? So. so uh... Yeah. So uh, positive parenting is a very popular term. and uh, sometimes you know uh, due to not being able to clearly understand these terms we sometimes tend to mix up mm. plus we are human beings not machines so even as psychologists i'm sure you and me we struggle with our kids so it's all right for everybody to have that struggle once in a while to feel overwhelmed once in a while and yet there are certain things certain sometimes basic things you know that if we just remember or brush through or here again it remains fresh in our minds and helps us to go through our daily challenges um so i will right away uh, dive into the presentation just let me know if my screen is visible it's coming up yeah okay so let us look at positive approaches to parenting we are not talking in a very technical uh, language today we're just trying to understand what are the little stuff that you know around the house that we can really do mm -hmm. and mix it up with our own parenting styles because all of us have different parenting styles and different cultures and values that we instill in our children so we will just look at what we can do broadly to help our children become better decision makers become better you know at their emotional quotient which is a very popular term these days and help them become successful um with self regulation strategies so um when we handle behavior we were talking a lot about you know desirable and undesirable behaviors in the last session so i would want to bring it to everyone's notice that basically there are two types of interventions we use when we want to handle behavior now i have put behavior on top and not misbehavior because we don't want to target or label any misbehavior and then you know attach it to a particular child so that it should not become a label of sorts so we will stick to our definitions of desirable and undesirable behaviors where we also know that undesirable behaviors are where the child is struggling to deal with his or her emotion so it is nothing that the child is doing on purpose but when we are trying to understand the undesirable bit of behavior we must also try to understand the reasons behind it and that's what we are going to focus on in today's session so when we use these interventions we use two kinds of interventions corrective and positive a lot of us flip the side from positive to corrective very often because there is a very thin line and there has been corrective parenting going on in our culture from generations to generations and i'm sure you will i can see you nodding your head so yeah uh corrective behavior typically results in increased levels of mental and physical illnesses aggression and disordered conduct more so these days now a lot of us might think that we were parented in this way and we were always told this and that and we always happened to listen to our parents and how is it that children today find it so difficult and how is it that these little things you know that little fear that we want to instill in our children um snowballs into something that is so catastrophic for our kids and which results in mental and physical illnesses so a uh, physical illnesses and mental illnesses both can creep in because of today's 
you know the world that we live in um when lifestyles we, lifestyles yes and plus the kind of safety net and security that we had during our childhood is not really there today because of nuclear families because of neighborhoods not being that open and warm uh, there are chances that if you do not reassure your child in the right way your corrective parenting might become something worse for the child also that is to do with the balance that you are striking right so yes corrective parenting is required in certain situations and at certain points of time but we must be able to strike the balance between corrective and positive parenting now when i talk about positive parenting positive parenting typically results in this is what just uh, say i think the slide hasn't moved to I'm the next on this slide corrective and positive okay okay great great yeah so positive uh, per- approaches typically result in reduced levels of mental and physical illnesses less uh, of aggression and less of disordered conduct so it becomes easier for us as parents to teach the lessons of maturity that we want to teach our children and adopt a more liberal kind of a uh, open kind of an atmosphere around these topics that you are dealing with with your child so as to be able to reach out to the child in the right way so let us now look at what the difference is why is it not uh, very advisable to go a uh towards the corrective approach and why is this approach better a corrective approach is reactive so when there is a undesirable behavior that occurs we react or respond to that behavior whereas the positive approach is proactive so setting of boundaries beforehand setting clear expectations beforehand are types of positive strategies which you can use in order to ensure that the undesirable behavior doesn't take place right corrective approach reprimanding approach ignores the feeling and the dignity of the child whereas here in the positive approach approach we can preserve the mutual respect because we respect the child's emotions a corrective approach makes the child feel low about himself the self belief self esteem goes down while the positive approach works towards raising it corrective demands compliance it's kind of a authoritative approach where you know uh, you demand some compliance from the child without any arguments or without any questions asked there is a positive approach presents choices you can do either this or that and as smart parents we must know what choices to give our children so that we are able to actually lead them into compliance but give them the illusion of choices uh because yes there are situations where there are no choices if this has to be done it has to be done and then there you cannot give them this choice that okay if you can do your homework if you want to do it or do not do if you do not want to so we might present the choices in such a way that we might lead them into compliance in a corrective approach the child feels unheard misunderstood here the child is heard he feels heard because we respond to the feeling behind the behavior okay and the corrective approach reads leads to the four r's resentment rebellion revenge is there and retreat okay so the child displaces his anger from the parent to a sibling okay there is a lot of anger there is sometimes a rebellion that if you've said this i'm not going to do it right in a positive approach we are able to motivate and encourage our children to do better next time and the competition comparison is with your previous performance and not with anyone around you so that makes a clear difference i'm sorry just give me a minute yeah teach us no control by offering no explanation right so it it is uh, we are not teaching our children any control we are not giving them any aspects of any framework to lie back on so that they can solve their own problems in in a positive approach you are able to teach your child self control by rationalization you are able to bring out the reason right by asking them the right kind of questions by striking the right kind of communications needs of the parents are met in the corrective approach because the children will do what you want them to do however the needs of parents and children are met in the positive approach because through these 
opportunities of learning as i want to call them uh, the undesirable behaviors we are able to teach our children self regulation discipline moral values and whatever else that we want to by adopting a more uh, proactive and mutually respectful mode which is the positive approach um what are the benefits of this approach thought here think- anagha yes um you know it seemed to me always that uh, there were two two binaries like you could either be corrective or be positive but one thing that is very interesting to know is that um you need to be both but you need to find a balance because you cannot always be positive it's equally important to be corrective in certain situations so that i think really stood out for me yes and i just wanted to highlight that yes um yes. also just a quick note anyone who's uh, you know watching us live please feel free to drop some questions uh, in the chat box the ones who've joined the zoom call please feel again free to drop your questions in the chat box we'll be coming back to them um, intermittently yes thank you so much devasmita for rephrasing it in such a wonderful manner it is really very very uh, interesting to see how we have to you know flip from one side to the other sometimes also because our children as they grow up mm. our parenting styles have to be appropriate to their age and appropriate to the development of the brain that has happened at that stage so as uh, i can clearly remember two ages given by zig ziglar there's a third one but i'm not able to recollect right away uh, the age of regulation which is when your children are younger you've got to regulate for them because they are unable to or regulate for themselves so providing a structure giving them certain things to do um giving them a particular time to do a particular thing is something that we need to regulate for them but as they grow we have to transition from this age of regulation to age of inspiration where we make them you know think about inspire them basically to think out of the box to think empathetically to use the life skills that they have picked up all this while and put it into practice and that is what it is all about the positive approach um if we adopt this approach the earlier the better because as they are younger you are able to train their little brains into particular experiences and wire it the way you want to wire them so fewer behavioral problems a close meaningful parent child relationship better self esteem and a sense of well being greater school performance greater social competence now this is where the social intelligence and emotional intelligence comes in children are able to navigate themselves in a better manner in such situations so that they are able to become uh, achieve what they want to achieve basically and more parenting self esteem and less stress here i am talking particularly about the parents how parents feel about their own parenting style so when you have a more positive approach you feel more better about your parenting style you feel more confident and there is obviously less stress because the uh, little little battles which happen uh, in our homes from morning to evening don't happen as we already have the infrastructure in place right so um, any thoughts here devasmita no i was just reflect i mean well actually yes but i was just uh, reflecting on how uh, all of this can wire children for well being because um, even social competent competence has such a, a huge role to play later on in life right when we are talking about meaningful connections with other humans being a huge predictor of well being and happiness it's something that uh, needs to be seeded at this age and maybe through uh, positive parenting and you know modeling those behaviors empathy all of that as you were saying so it really ties very well together uh, with what we want to to feel to be as adults Absolutely. i think we're just talking about um, you know as parents initiating those practices modeling those practices for them right from a very early age absolutely and uh, since our parenting style is a little mindful a positive approach is obviously a little more mindful it also helps the children to become mindful and it is your best bet if you want to instill life skills like self awareness emotional regulation um, empathy problem solving cognitive flexibility all of these life skills are extremely important in fact if not more as important as your formal education absolutely and positive parenting is one big tool that we have as parents to instill these uh, skills in and develop these skills because 
in our children, right? Um, so let us have a look at the structure or uh, you know the principles of positive approach. The purpose of a positive approach is to train for correction and maturity. So to to be able to basically teach the child to catch their own fish in terms of mental well-being and emotional health side, right? The purpose is not punitive. The purpose is to train them, to correct them in the right way, to redirect them to the right direction. Focus of positive parenting is future correct acts and not in the past. Last time also when I told you this, this happened. You know, how many times I've been telling you this, the focus shifts to the past. So if we can shift the focus instead of the past to the future, the children will also be able to learn that it's no use brooding over spilt milk, but it is always very essential for us to, uh, you know, nowadays they want to call it feed forward also, not feed back. It's, it's a new term, feed forward. Um, and also that it's okay to make mistakes, you know, it's absolutely. okay to go wrong. I think that's such a fundamental lesson which we learn um, well. And into overcoming adulthood. failures. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Um, also, the target of positive approach is the feeling, the needs that lead to the behavior and not the behavior per se. The behavior is definitely present and it definitely needs to change. But it will only change when the cause behind it is dissected, analyzed, and, uh, you know, attended to. The attitude of the parent that goes across to the children is love and concern. The attitude of the parent is always love. Uh, the attitude of the parent is always love and concern, right? Whether it is any other style of parenting. But specifically in um, the positive approach, the attitude of the parent goes across to the child. The child feels the love. The child feels and sees the concern of the parent. Um, resulting emotion in the child is security versus insecurity. Uh, the child is self-assured. The child is the child knows that you know there is a safety net which uh, his parents are holding out for him or her, and he will be taken care of. Uh, the time spent together is time in. So positive parenting strategies are not punitive, and therefore they do not have the time out concept. They may have the time away concept or they may have the time in concept. So if there is a little battle that is going on between the mother and child, what you could do is distract the child by saying, let's do something else together and come back to this once you're more feeling more calm. Versus the time away concept, go have a look at your glitter jars or sit by the window, do some breathing exercises or sing a song and come back when you're feeling calmer. That is time away. But in this, we have a time in concept where time is spent together, specifically when your child is, you know, struggling with a particular emotion. And the consequences, of course, focus on resolution of the problem. What are the various ways in which we can solve it and the natural outcome of events? What's going to happen if you use a particular, exploring the outcomes, exploring the resources to solve a particular problem or a problem behavior? Uh, so let's move on to certain strategies, hand-picked, very uh, brief. Focus on the reasons behind the behavior. There is always a reason why your child behaves the way he does. There is always a reason the way we behave, the way we do, right? There's always something that is happening in response to something. Now that something, the stimulus to which we respond, might be hidden, might be silly for adults but it might mean the world for the child. We were talking about this in the last session also, that it may be silly for us as adults. Why are you crying over such a small thing? But that small thing might mean the world to the child. So acknowledge their wish. So um, if the child is crying over a broken toy or if the child is crying over a failed exam, acknowledge their wish. Say, you, you wish you had passed this test. You wish you could have got into that college that you had dreamt of getting into. So, you know, reflection of what they are feeling is important. It makes them feel heard. It makes them feel understood. Oh, you wish we could have gone for a picnic today. And unfortunately, it is raining. So give it to them, at least in their fantasies. And maybe talk about it. What would you have done 
if you would have gone there and you have missed out on all of that and it's all right for you to feel disappointed and heartbroken because yes you've lost out on a wonderful opportunity and they need your emotional and rational support so fourth step would be to rationalize from the point of their feeling to what can they do now what was your plan b what was your plan c right and then work towards that so from their emotion from from being their emotional support you have also become their rational support now thinking brain and then probably maybe reexamine your expectations once in a while maybe you're expecting something that is not age appropriate for your child something that is beyond the reach of your child maybe his attitude or his interest towards what you want him to do is not as expected so that might help you to understand why your child is struggling at a particular thing or is angry with a particular class or does not want to do a particular task that you've set for him or her it's very important for parents to draw that fine line between you know me wanting my child to do something and the child wanting to do it right vicarious learn, uh, living we many a times uh, mix that up with you know because we are our uh, excuses i know what's best for my child oh yes you do know what's best for your child but it's it's also not going to work if you don't take your child's interests and attitudes um in in uh, consideration when you set up a task for your child any thoughts there debispit i can see you nodding your head quite furiously <laughs> no just just a lot of resonance you know i think uh, also a few questions have come in which i do want to share but um i was just thinking on how um we pass on our own expectations sometimes um you know with teenagers it becomes like a standard conflict where they're adults one moment and the next moment they want to cuddle and they you know start acting like a 7 year old or an 8 year old and it's just as confusing for the parents to regulate their own expectations from their adolescent um you know children yes. so yeah yeah and adolescence is that time it's it's again a transition time and change is always hard so uh, it's transformation and uh, sometimes we hear ourselves telling now you're old enough and then we hear ourselves telling them you're not so old enough so you know we also are probably not clear as to what is allowed for an adolescent and what is not allowed so reexamining our expectations setting them apart with clarity and giving the child the clarity of what is expected of him or her will definitely help in uh, putting all of this framework together absolutely one thing that i relate to very much is you know even during the lockdown when we all suddenly shifted to working from home now it's it's very new for the children to understand that oh uh, my mother is home but i'm not supposed to talk to her or i'm not supposed to you know suddenly go and jump on her or or you know do something else that i want to do correct and um, i think and for for me it was a struggle to to establish the boundary and especially in our line of work where confidentiality is so important to create that line where even though i am home but you're not going to work and expecting them to honor and understand that was a huge challenge and one thing that one thing that helped of course um, there was a lot of you know i must admit a lot of correcting parenting that happened there as well uh, but one thing that probably helped was as you said to lay down very clear rules hmm. and explaining to them you know the different kinds of things i do why is it important that they not come into the room when i am on a call or uh, all of that and then eventually as you were saying the rational support probably helped um there as well so i'm seeing how all of these things can you know kind of bend into each other and they're all very very intertwined absolutely and uh, for all of this to happen it is important that we also approach it with an open mind mm -hmm. so if we are wanting to adopt any of these strategies midway like if suppose my child is 7 or 8 and now i start using these strategies it may seem to the child that i am being a little more liberal or permissive mm. so it is very important for me to have those clear boundaries in my mind as also not give up because right. again transition any kind of transition is difficult so when you are transitioning from one style of parenting to the other style the child might get some confusing signals 
but we have to persist. We have to, um, you can't expect anything to happen in a week's time or maybe you have to work on it months together and then might be, we will be able to put a, um, you know, a roadmap of sorts, a blueprint of sorts on which we will then model our future uh, rules, boundaries and tackle any problems that crop up within a parent and a child, specifically during adolescence. It is important that we have these blueprints ready by the time they become adolescents so that we have something to fall back on and say, okay, this is what we've been doing and this is what we will stick to. So sticking to the basics sometimes also helps. True, uh, true. Yeah. Um, I had a question here. Uh, so, you know, what if, what if someone has not practiced this for, let's say, in the early childhood years and the child's now, let's say, 12, and this is when they realize that, oh, there's something called positive parenting and this is how they are, it's done. How do they make that transition? You know, how do they not, like you said, confuse the child? Um, is, it, is it a good idea to tell them? Is it a good idea to just make the changes? If you have any thoughts on that. Uh, so it depends again on the child's maturity and age appropriate, uh, you know, tasks that we set mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. uh, a 12 year old, one 12 year old might be very different from the other 12 year old. So it's up to the parents to then understand at what level of maturity their child is. I'm currently seeing about uh, six or seven 12 year olds and each of them are very different from each other. Mm -hmm. So the one who has a rational mind can be sat down and explained that we think these things will help us as a family grow and mm -hmm. will help us to uh, you know establish those meaningful relationships also we don't like arguing with you on these little things every day so maybe we could bring about some changes in the way we communicate with each other and this is what we're going to try and that will help with someone who's achieved that kind of emotional maturity for someone who's a little behind, because each child develops, it's not nothing wrong if your child is not that mature at that age. It's just a graph, you know, and they will reach that space one, um, you know, maybe six months here and there, one year here and there, but they will be there in that zone. But if your child has not reached there, a better idea would be like, you know, getting down to the child's level, explaining age appropriate facts like you did with your uh, profession it's so complicated for them to understand the confidentiality bit but you were able to get across to them by going down to their level probably using a story stories are something that connect souls and everyone likes hearing stories children and adults alike so um, connecting them to different stories sharing your own life experiences and then setting these uh, rules down along with the child, it should not be imposed. It should not be a one-way communication, mm -hmm. but something that both of the, both the parties have worked together on, both the parties have agreed on, and then make a deal of sorts and try implementing it. No, absolutely. Absolutely. I think um, it's important to remember that, uh, you know, it's a struggle. And there is like, as you know, as you were saying that there is no clear path or there is no one path. So um, I wonder if, and maybe I'm digressing a little bit here, but I wonder if it's okay to admit to the child that, look, I made mistakes. And maybe that wasn't the best way to go. But at the time, that's the best I could think of. I know better now. And, you know, let's try this. Uh, because I think that, you know, while uh, we might, intuitively know that oh I shouldn't have done that it becomes a bit of a power struggle to acknowledge that with children especially yeah. older kids because yeah. it it destabilizes the equation that you have with them you know you fear that oh I, they may not respect me they may not listen to me I might lose um, my stand power superiority all of the I, it sounds sort of you know uh, abrupt an extreme when I bring it up, but that's a very real struggle. Absolutely. For yes. a lot I of parents. Yes, yes, it is. Um, again, you know, it is always uh, good to be a little more transparent and to accept that, yes, I messed up. Because it's again going to give your children a framework to work on when they mess up. So you're modeling a skill already. Uh, point number two, uh, the power struggle that you mentioned, and you also mentioned the word fear, which kind of resonates with me. 
more often comes from the parents insecurity that my child is going to reject me my child is not going to respect me those are my insecurities but if you can probably have uh, if you are a good legilimens and you can actually peep in into the child's brain and read what's going on there i'm sure your child might be angry with you might be resenting what you did to him but towards the end of the day they are going to come down and you know that relationship that bond has been so strong for all these years so there's no reason that it will just you know frizzle out in the adolescent years unlikely very unlikely unless something major happens so it's all right for us to say yes i messed up mm-hmm. and i would like to do this what mm-hmm. would you do i'm going to mm-hmm. do one two three what are you going to do yeah this yeah. both parties have to contribute true true and maybe you know like sometimes kids end up saying things which are very harsh like yes. oh i don't love you i hate you you know you you don't want me to be happy uh, things like that which can be very jarring very hurtful to parents and you know um for uh, very valid reasons but i think it it might help as you were saying earlier to understand the reason behind that behavior understand yes. where it's coming from and you know address it or let it slide accordingly but yes and reflection in such times at the in the moment in the heat of the moment is this that you know i i can see you're very upset with mama and we will talk when you know when i am calm and when you are calm because obviously when you are hurling that such things at me i am also losing my balance and i don't want to talk to my children when i'm angry and hungry right <laughs> so uh, maybe when we calm down and when we talk to them we can tell them without drama that i was upset when you said this to me Absolutely. that is also very essential to be completely transparent about the emotion you felt mm. and you know instead of saying you insulted me whatever you said i felt insulting right. or i felt insulted and i felt yeah. upset about it so yeah. you don't have to show the child you're angry and upset you can say that that's mm. the difference mm. right without a lot of drama <laughs> yeah so yes mm. reexamining our own expectations is very important and for this parents must have a very open mindset if i have a mindset that whatever i am doing that's the best i can do now isse zyada main aur kya karu if we have that kind of attitude we might not be able to bring about the changes in our children and one thing i tell a lot of parents who bring their children to me for counseling is before you expect your child to change you've got to change and that is i think very important and profound right that's absolutely golden i think and you know i've have i've also had several of these experiences where um the child's first deceived into coming to counseling that oh you know aunty yes. se baat kar lo right ah. this is my old friend why don't you talk to her so anyone who's thinking that your child might need help or should talk to a professional that's that's the absolute worst way to do it Yes, right. Yes. Do you, not only do you lose credibility yourself, you also take away from the trust that you know we are trying to build as professionals. Yes. So yeah, but um, yeah, absolutely. Yes, and uh, therefore honesty and transparency from both ends, complete honesty and transparency from both ends is essential. What I say might hurt the other person. It might be unpleasant. Nevertheless, I must have the courage to say it. so that the boundaries are clear at all times shall we move on then absolutely absolutely let's see what more uh the other thing that we have already spoken so much on the last slide that we've almost covered everything that is uh, on this be kind yet firm it's all right for us to not shout out it's all right for us to not be you know demand compliance or be a dictator we can be kind we can be empathetic towards their emotions and yet we need to be firm so once a no is forever a no whatever the meltdown comes it is also essential for us to be clear and consistent in whatever we say do and promise our children expect age appropriate behavior a lot of times uh, this happens in our households that you are the older one you give in yeah Now the older child is also 7 the older child is also 8 and that's not a very you know mature age and do not expect your el- the elder sibling to behave maturely just because he's older it's not his fault right <laughs> so true <laughs> there's a question i think that ties in very well to this anagha um so uh, someone is asking how do i reexamine my expectations uh from my child 
and uh, you know put it across yeah so if you find your child is struggling to deal with something hmm. you know when you are uh, expecting the child to do a b c d say uh, get organized for their own college in ensure that they finish their assignments on time etc and the child is not able to do that you might have to re examine your expectations and see if he or she is in the right frame of mind if he or she is able to understand if he or she has enough interest in it to be able to live up to your expectations maybe mm-hmm. the child is not in the right frame of mind at that particular point of time having gone through a bad breakup maybe right. the child uh, uh, is not understanding well what is going on in the uh, class maybe mm-hmm. he or she has been ridiculed or feels the pressure of a particular teacher and therefore is not doing well in that particular subject or maybe just maybe that the child is just not interested in learning that keyboard and you have you know insisted on the child learning the keyboard because you saw him playing a song on someone else's keyboard so th- mm. that's the way when you see your child struggling that's when you need to reexamine your expectations and see if what you expect of them is something that they want to do they have enough interest to do they have enough potential to do and they have enough time for it also because time is also a big struggle especially for adolescents these days there are yeah. too many classes there are the day, whole day is packed there's hardly any transition time you know That's for true. you to be able to uh, jump from one call to the other we need some time in between to reorganize our thoughts Mm, which true. doesn't happen they jump from a chemistry class to a keyboard class to a dance class then they go swimming so you know in that and there is way, pressure to excel at all of them huh? imagine that yes and this pressure is hidden sometimes you don't say it explicitly but the child feels the pressure absolutely so if absolutely. You, yeah if your child feels the pressure you need to reexamine your expectations maybe so, you expect you yeah, know saying yeah, things yeah. like um oh it's all right as long as you're enjoying it which is what i'm saying but then i'm so full of appreciation for someone who came first at whatever right. task it might be that will clearly send a confusing signal that while i'm okay with you doing what you're doing i clearly am you know excited about some other child who's performing better or who's won a trophy or something so right. um then your words are meaningless in the sense you know what you were trying to say earlier was meaningless yeah you're also sometimes in denial you know of the fact that my child does not want to do this so we insist that try kar lo don't give up so soon maybe you know wait for another 6 months or so one or two exams dekhe dekho so also this exam thing is tied up with everything so <laughs> keyboard mein bhi exam hota hai music mein bhi exam it's it's good to do i'm not i'm not criticizing that approach it is essential that our children uh, who have multi talents excel in them and become successful at everything that they want to do but just to reexamine and see if your child is feeling frustrated if your child is feeling anxious if your child has performance anxiety where is it coming from will it right. be all right for you to you know uh, tune down attenuate one activity mm-hmm. and give more attention to the child's emotional and mental well being right right you know i feel like also um holding space safe space for the child to come in communicate to you that okay this is what i'm feeling and i don't want to continue with this and uh, all of that so that's also something along with everything else it might be difficult but it's important to nurture that yes and um at the same time i love that that bit where you said uh, you know there needs to be emotional and rational support so you know it helps cultivate the wise mind where you're aware of your emotions but you're also at the same time acting uh, you know from a place of reason and uh, rationality so nurturing these things um slowly and gradually is something that is is probably a a good way to look at it yes yes absolutely so um we come back to expecting age appropriate behavior from our children mm-hmm. our 8 year old may not behave like the other 8 year old but only you know your child's physical and emotional growth chart mm-hmm. so ensure that you are at par with your child and you are addressing him at his or her level undesirable behavior must be viewed as a learning opportunity because there is where you can lay the foundational stones of these life skills and skill development and other things later on Mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. um it's important for you to put down everything that you are doing 
and attend to that undesirable behavior at that time mm-hmm. because you know strike the iron when it is hot yeah so which also does not mean that you drive the point in when the child is angry of course we've been saying that allow the child to calm down and when you both are at a calmer a state mm. the more receptive to whatever is happening then rationalize right there's another question i think again it ties into what you're talking about right now so um someone's asked how to do damage control after a heated conversation with my teenage son regarding his freedom and restrictions so a uh-huh. very very clear you know <laughs> common point of con- conflict parents and teenage children <laughs> restrictions and freedom right i think it's like um um really so enough for all parents especially teenage children absolutely absolutely but yeah that that's a good question you know because sometimes these conversations do get heated you know they say things you say things you're human and uh, yeah before you know it you're you've done more damage than you thought you could right so absolutely. how to come back from those so the first thing is um to set proactive goals in terms of what is freedom and what is restriction mm-hmm. and it is essential that our children understand that freedom is a privilege and it comes with some responsibility i think spiderman's done a good job of <laughs> drilling that <Yeah. laughs> i'm sure i'm sure i'm sure and um, once we've established this you know freedom you've got to pay a price for freedom so you've got to build your trust you've got to be reliable you've got to be more openly communication you know openly communicating to your parents about whatever is going on and those lines have to be established now even after establishing this line these lines i'm sure there are heated arguments and sometimes both parties lose their cool um i would only say this that if there is anything that stops you from approaching your own child and making up it can only be ego so maybe we could especially when you have teenage parents i mean teenage children at home and you are parents of teenagers you have to lock it up in a room and leave it there until your children grow up because you are the elder one you have a more rational brain than they have and you mm-hmm. have more control over your hormones than they have so Absolutely. yes it is for you to approach them to reassure them which is my mm. last one always be reassuring to your children to say a sorry that i messed up mm. to convey the feeling that when you did this i felt this yeah. and i'm really very feeling very upset about it did you really mean it how else would you want me to correct you or guide you for this particular thing mm-hmm. you thought you were you know jumping over the line by doing this mm. and i was really concerned for you so whatever came from my end was from a place of concern about your safety about your uh, growth about your you going over the right going into the right direction so how is it that you would want me to give you these reminders without both of us having to blow the top off or blow the roof off hmm i think these are that sounds things. great to have some sort of a contract um you know that is discussed with the child that okay you know if this happens then this happens and not punitive but it's really like with mutual agreement that okay you know these are the lines this is the responsibility this is the freedom you have um and here is what you know happens when you don't do this or here, this is how i'm going to remind you this is your this is our safety protocol our triage right i think that's a wonderful wonderful uh, again like a golden nugget if i may say but i also feel like adding and you know this is probably coming from my own experience growing up i feel that uh, my father was excessively restrictive hmm. can't go here you can't go there you know you can't go to your friend's party you can, can never have sleepovers that is not even you know you can't even imagine that um and it it felt excessive uh, in in comparison to what was the norm at the time what my friends were doing what was what everybody was doing at the time so do you think that sometimes parents um also need to reexamine their idea of freedom and restriction um yes i think in many cases they must mm-hmm. um whatever is permitted so if you if you take the basis um of you know their own value system and culture system that they follow at home whatever is permissible they mm-hmm. must do and a little bit changes on the fringe 
is all right mm-hmm. maybe they may they may not want to change the core of their family values and that's all right because the child also needs to understand that there are some values that my family lives by right right, right. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that is one and uh, the other thing when you said is overly being restrictive is also not very good because then you will have the chances that your child may um, do certain things and not come back and tell you absolutely and there is a very clear sense of um, you know mistrust right. um that you don't you trust me enough to do this right or, or to you know um stay on the right path and things like that so yeah that's a tricky line to to start for parents that is a tricky line and it is very overwhelming also sometimes because you you whatever you do you end up uh, you know upsetting your team mm mm-hmm, mm mm-hmm. right? so um it is a very uh, uh, tender line it's a very tender area to approach absolutely but, um communication and talking it out rationalization mm. and redirection is the only thing that we can do and you know stumble and fall and brave the storm because the storm is there and we have to all brave it <laughs> right in fact your teen is also going through a very big storm because so if he demanding certain things of you Mm-hmm. um those demands also come from some emotional need or some need for security the need to belong in a particular group because everyone else is doing it i want to do it if i don't do it i'm going to be isolated so in those situations also how much will you give in for your peers is and you know is uh, that the education that should be given to your teens by yeah. the parents how much will you change for your peers how much will you give in mm. right and how uh, you will say a no assertiveness right and being a follow, not being a follower but being a leader and things like that. so these are all opportunities for us to you know build on these skills true true and i feel like those pressures are more now than they were ever before you know in the history with social media and everything it's earlier Absolutely. i could compare myself to five of my friends now i can compare myself to um every child on the planet who has a phone absolutely yeah so, yeah and then the difference between facts and opinions uh, we have so many children who come to us with a crashed self esteem because of some uh, comment on the social media platforms so you know you you've got to teach your children that comprehension to be able to differentiate between facts and to be able to differentiate between what is an opinion yeah. because someone says something it's their opinion and not necessarily the fact so to be able to dissect there's information overload coming in from everywhere Well. so also um uh, i think like you know whole the whole uh, adolescence in um, social media is like a separate conversation um but uh, you know one thing that comes to mind is i remember having a a, pair, a father who came in was talking to me about his 16 year old daughter saying that she's constantly negotiating she's constantly you know anything i tell her she's arguing and she's you know she's pushing back and what do i do i said nothing that's absolutely healthy you know that's you the you're lucky you don't realize it because the other end is when children go quiet they don't want to talk they don't want to communicate they're doing things and they want to exclude you from their lives right and um, it's good to have these tussles it's good to have these negotiations these conversations even if they are a little heated right but to to hold on to the fact that you know at the end of the day we are a family there's a reassurance i'm always there for you you know to support you so if those things are in place i think heated conversations can only do like you know very little very little damage correct correct right. and for this reason uh, we also got to look at the factors that influence you know right. the positive approach like you said it's always mm-hmm. negotiating she's always doing this it takes a toll on your mental energy True. especially at the end of the day when you have your own life experiences frustrations you may have got your boss you may have had a very bad day at the office you mm-hmm. may have not agreed with your spouse on certain things and then those social expectations that i'm supposed to be a you know attend to all personal intimate relationships in the family as well as my professional life and those 1000 million phone calls that come in in a day it just takes it just drives me crazy it drains me of my emotional energy so i do not really have any energy left in me to have that negotiation conversation with my teenage daughter so it is a very so real it's a very it's mm. a very uh, raw real situation that mm. we all go through but uh, oodles and oodles of patience is something that we must have 
And for us to be able to overcome this, it's essential that we stay connected with ourselves, mm. that we have some time out for ourselves, which I'm going to talk about uh, in my next slide. And that is um, <clears throat> irritable parent leads to a reactive child. There are more past struggles. There's no energy left for positive parenting. And then we tend to gripe for peace. Okay, you go, don't trouble me. And children are very, very receptive to this. They're very, very perceptive. They know when dad has, has had a bad day. They know when to put in the, that permission slip and they know when to get his signature out of him because they are able to play around these dynamics very, very smartly. Mm -hmm. And then when you start gratifying demands in this manner, it also leads to more meltdowns because the demands go on increasing. Mm -hmm. And then we indulge unknowingly in unhealthy parenting practices, which leads us to burnout. And then there is a sense of unfulfillment. And yeah. again, which leads to irritability. So there is this whole vicious circle in which you get caught mm -hmm. if you are not connected with yourself, if you have not drawn those boundaries clearly, and then the past struggles will never end. Mm. Mm. Right? So very, very, very true. essential. And if you feel the need again, like I keep reiterating, there is nothing wrong for parents to come up and seek professional help from mm. a parent coach if they think they're struggling with dealing with their Absolutely. younger children, preteens, teens, or even young adults. Mm. Very, very necessary, at least in today's times. True, true. Because, yeah, the, the reality is that even adults have far less support nowadays than they had previously. So it's it's very real that parenting seems more daunting than it did maybe, you know, a right. generation yes. ago. Also, but I think I the boundaries, have, hmm. yes, the boundaries between work and home uh, life okay. were very clear. You yeah. shut your system off at 5 p.m. and you come home and you rarely had work from home. But these days, the work seems to never end. It's Monday to Friday, 24 bar 7. And then two weeks, we just let loose. <laughs> two days, we just let loose over the weekend and come back on uh, Monday. So the steam is never let out. Mm, so true. I have a question here, Anaga. And, uh, you know, I feel like uh, this is something that is still very new. I think we're just grasping these ideas of positive parenting. I think anybody, anyone from, you know, your and my generation would uh, not have been parented like this mostly we have what we have seen is at best corrective and mm. you know the worst can be so much worse right mm. um so it is something that i think we tend to question a lot like uh, you know in my experience also when i've tried talking about parents uh, about positive parenting to people they've, they've said I, I don't know i don't know if this, this is going to really work or um I don't even know what to do because it's so new to me. You know, I have to read the book to now parent because I have not seen anything like So ah. there's, you know, how we we sort of jokingly say that, you know, Tappal Belan Ekat Thappar uh -huh. was like, okay, and you know, you're not, you're being That's yelled at. or children. Right. <laughs> or, 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 you know, like your mother's not talking to you for three days. It's absolutely normal. Uh, you know, there's nothing wrong about it. And uh, how do you make this huge shift? Or even yeah. accept the idea that, oh, these are things which are going to work, right? So that's, uh, there's a big resistance oh. there, I feel. And I, parents I, I, then tell me that, hey, I know, you know, it's not going to work with my child. Absolutely. So I want to ask you, are there scenarios where this won't work? Positive parenting does not work. Is there a scenario like that? say uh, there might be situations when you have younger children where you will have to adopt a more corrective approach but it is always about striking the balance uh, again i'm saying it is very important for parents to have an open mind the other major difference is we all grew up with our peers we had elder cousins we had elder friends around in the neighborhood who were our role models whom we could you know uh, attach some meaning to and follow these days we lived more with children who were of our age, plus minus. Children today live more with adults. And that's why you will see younger children talk exactly like adults. And when they speak like adults, everybody around them boos and has. So it is kind of reinforced, which is not wrong. It's a change in lifestyle. It's a change in the situation. But that's the major difference. And therefore, they think 
talk and behave more like you know more mature than their age like right. i have a lot of friends who tell me when we were their age humko to itna bhi nahi samajhta tha mm-hmm. so it's, it's mm-hmm. correct in a way because we were not involved in adult talk at all at that time we never knew what our parents were doing because when we got together we were all together as you know the kids and the, that and and that community mm-hmm. so will it work will it not work it will work because uh, the times have changed mm-hmm. the exposure has changed the information coming into our children has changed mm-hmm. so it is important for us to fill in that gap of elder cousins and elder friends who would otherwise tell things to our to us we have mm-hmm. to fill that gap in for our children true 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 and it is always about striking a balance if you are all the time doing positive parenting it tilts towards the permissive parenting side where the children are in control of the household and whatever the child says happens ah oh, yeah and then if you are all the time correcting you tend to be a little more authoritarian mm. so it's all about striking a balance between the two approaches so that you're able to take the best of each and then use it for your own benefit and your child's benefit right that's that's very well said it's really about the balance these things in principle should work for everyone but however if you're making a very sudden transition from being like you know majorly corrective to suddenly being like this it might confuse the child it might seem like oh now i can take advantage of this are papa ne to data hi nahi acha chalo you know so uh, maybe a little bit of explanation along with that but what you're saying uh, is that this is likely to work for almost all kids hmm. right so, uh, and the as long as also hmm. is we don't live leave the behavior unattended positive parenting may you're not leaving the behavior unattended you're not saying that you know okay it's okay you did this you're going right. to say to the child that what you did was wrong and what you did upset me and probably you were feeling like this and therefore you did this maybe next time you could try any other behavior right so basically putting it all together for the child rather than just screaming why did you do this in my you know while not making the environment threatening to them absolutely right so the correction is still mm, happening right 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 yeah yeah i think that's a major concern that oh if we are so relaxed then ye to bigad jayega but no that's not the case you know you are still uh, making changes in their behavior in the undesired behavior just the method is just so much more safe yeah. yeah and and positive parenting takes more energy It than does. corrective parenting it's so you know, easy uh, to it's go down easy. that path yeah to you know, to go down the path of corrective parenting is very easy it's quick right but this takes so much more deliberate um, action and you know so much more awareness and presence and patience as you rightly said yes. right there's one question that i really want to get to before we close because it seems again like a lot of people may resonate with it um so it says my child has been quiet for some time now doesn't talk much however much i try to be jolly around her she doesn't engage in conversation with me how do i get her to start talking it doesn't mention the age of the child but um do you have do you have anything to say to that maybe we could start with playing board games together if the child is reluctant to play board games with you maybe uh, just try being around the child and not have any conversation so if she is reading you read if she paints you paint if she plays you play if she listens to the mu- to a particular music you listen maybe then slowly you might be able to watch a video or a movie together and use that to start conversation mm-hmm. if you see that if you feel as a mother because a mother's instinct must never be ignored mm-hmm. so if you feel as a mother that this sense of withdrawal is coming from something major and there's something majorly wrong with your child see an expert nearby as mm-hmm. soon as possible right right i think that's that's you know on point um try being a part of her life try being you know engaged but if you see this persisting for a while then do see somebody about it yes also observe her for other red flags whether she is not able to enjoy what she used to enjoy before if she is given up on activities that used to give her pleasure before if she is not talking much to her you mm-hmm. know uh, friends and when she is alone is she completely alone or if she is with a gadget Mm-hmm. that is also equally important because if she is spending all her time on the gadgets probably she is engaging in a lot more conversations than you are aware of but they may not be completely healthy <laughs> right right 
Mm. There's someone who also asked that um, I get very worked up when my child uh, does not disengage from the gadget. So how do I deal with that? that? Can you please repeat? So someone has asked that uh, that they, the parent themselves get very worked up when the child does not disengage from a device. You know, like they've been told, okay, abhi, abhi chhod do phone, don't, don't stay on the phone, but the child refuses to disengage. And that gets the parent worked up. And I'm guessing it just leads to the whole thing becoming very unpleasant and escalating. So sure. any thoughts on that? Again, structure, routine, boundaries, if those are previously established, this may not happen. If it is still happening, remember that you are friendly with your child, but you're not their friend. So in this case, if you have to adopt a more corrective course, so be it. Switch off the Wi-Fi, change the password, do all it takes to get the child. There will surely be a meltdown after it. Allow the child to express his disappointment, hurt and anger. And when when the child is calmed, rationalize, redirect. And say, mm-hmm. I'm going to return this phone to you only if one, two, three, four things are being followed. True. And then have those doable consequences, which will, which will be tough. See, it's not a magic wand. You make a timetable today and from tomorrow, the child starts following it. It's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. But we have to persist. We have to insist. And we have to have, I don't know how many kilos of patience. <laughs> also, this, this idea that children need to be told something again and again and again and again, and, you know, and that becomes part of our rant a lot of times that how many times have I told you to not do this, but that's exactly how their brains are wired. You just have to keep telling them, reiterating till it, it seeps in. Yeah, 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 right. A lot of times when we see such behaviors, we tend to question our children. What did you just do? What did I tell you? Mm-hmm. Do you remember how, what I have told you about this? It is a little threatening. Yeah. Instead, if we say to the child, you know, I think you must just put it down and go sit there. Mm-hmm. You know, these specific instructions sometimes help because the child is in, in, in an intense state of emotion and is not thinking. So specific small instructions help. Yeah, yeah. Even just, I feel, you know, it's something that I have tried and has worked very well is just to practice this. Okay, now you're going to sit and think. Hmm. Just think about what happened. Think about what you did and then we'll come back and talk about it. Right. And just pulling that break uh, in whatever it is that's happening, pausing that and getting them to think is also something that um, I feel is helpful. Help. Yeah, right. It's, you know, changes at so many levels internally as well. Absolutely, because mm-hmm. it just breaks the stream of thought Mm. and distracts the children into some uh, uh, some other activity for younger children we use crazy balls or visual those visually uh, attractive glitter jars and stuff like that for older children sit down and think might help um, it would also help to for, uh, for a child who's not able to calm down even when he or she is left alone you could suggest that maybe you know listen to your favorite song and then come back and talk to me It might take them some time to plug in those earphones and actually get into the mood of listening. But specific uh, instructions like these may help a child who is really struggling and does not know how to distract himself. Right. Right. So um, we've come to the last slide, which is our uh, final takeaway. And for positive parenting, what we need to do is connect with the children, connect with their feelings, connect with their needs, what do they need right now? Do they need my support? Do they need my listening to? Sometimes mm. they don't need solutions to their problems. They only, especially adolescents, they only want to come and pour their heart out. So just hear them and then maybe offer help rather than saying, okay, then you should have done this or you should have done that. That is providing solutions. But instead say, oh, I can see you're very upset. How can I help you? And and that that is an open-ended question that might maybe they will say, you know, I I don't want anything. I'll handle it. I just wanted to tell you about it, right? Mm -hmm. Connect with their expectations. They expect you to spend some time with them. They expect you to have some conversations with them. Sometimes they expect you to leave them alone. So resonate with them and understand what is expected of you, which is a uphill task. (laughs) And I empathize with parents on that one. But um, yes, I had seen a poster somewhere where the parent was asking the adolescent um, how are you and uh, he just slammed the door the cartoon uh, thing slammed the door and said don't talk to me so you know you don't know what will upset them 
especially when they are at that stage. Connect with their thoughts, having open conversations, having a safe, non-judgmental space, voicing out your opinions and inviting theirs is something that will help you understand what's going on, what's cooking in their minds uh, and connect with their insecurities. Like we, like us, they are also very, very insecure. We have our insecurities, whether they will turn out to be good people, whether he will reject me or, you know, um, not like me or hate me or whether there'll be a big fight between him and his father. And all of those insecurities are ours and they mm. have their own too, whether True. they will be accepted True. by their peers. Mm. If they have a new idea, whether their parents will accept it. Mm. A lot of uh, teens who are now exploring, even with sexual orientations, mm -hmm. um, start thinking that they belong to one place and not the other. And they are very, very anxious whether their parents will accept them if there is something queer about them. Absolutely. So I think this runs, you know, it might, it definitely starts in, in teenage, but um, I've seen this become like the central point of their struggle, even for, you know, people who are well into adulthood. Right. How are their parents going to take it? How are their parents going to accept it? Right. So, yeah. And there are many other such things. You know, this is still a big thing in terms of our culture and our community. But there are other things which children struggle with uh, and are very anxious about how their parents will accept it. So in the end, I see all, all families, basically, parents seeking the child's approval and the child seeking the parent's approval. So mm -hmm. it's all about, you know, how you're bonded together. And uh, starting early is the time to start. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, um, so many little things that, that came out of today's conversation, I've kind of made my notes on the side as well. But uh, to summarize a few things that stood out for me were one, how along with emotional support, we need to provide the rational support as well. And, uh, you know, teach children to balance those two. Yes. Um, looking at the reason behind their behavior and not reprimanding just the behavior, but addressing the reason right? Um, watching your own expectations, maybe even readjusting your own expectations a little bit. And uh, last, but, uh, you know, I think profound is to really connect with them at all levels, not only um, for, you know, norms and rules and academics and things like that, but also um, the insecurities, their emotions, their needs, their drives, all of that. Right. But Absolutely. I also honestly feel like, you know, parents just take a deep breath because this is tough. You know, this is, this sounds difficult. This 24 by 7 parenting, this being positive, you know, the positive parenting, despite all the challenges that you are going through and still keeping it authentic, I think is a, is really a challenge. It and it requires, lovely. yeah, it just requires so much of fortitude. So, yeah, we're, we're, you know, we're always there. In fact, this is one of those spaces where you can, you can come and share and talk and get help if you need to. Right. Um, you have any, any closing thoughts, Anagha, anything? Yeah, just this maybe, you know, uh, to summarize everything that we have spoken about today, I call them the five R's of positive parenting. Receive them as they are. Reflect so they can realize and learn rationalize so they can also think on their own, redirect so they develop coping skills and reassure so they are secure and well-adjusted. Because adolescents, if you say, are you know preparing for their flight out of the nest and your nest is going to be empty very soon. So value them and love them all you can at this time because that's what they need to brave the storm that they are going through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for putting all of this, um, not only beautifully, but in so well structured. I'm sure that the, you know, the five R's and even the other things that you've said are um, really valuable. They're very precious. So uh, really, again, thanks, Anagha, for uh, the wonderful conversation, for answering all the questions so patiently. And um, for everyone who's watching us, uh, this is a space where we talk about parenting adolescents every Friday at 5 p.m. Next week, we are going to be talking about um, parenting superpowers. 
with uh, Manoj Shetigar, who's just authored a book called Parenting Superbars, and he's going to be sharing, you know, insights on how to um, essentially, you know, uh, reflect and change yourself so that you can become a super parent of sorts. So do stay tuned in and uh, we'll see you again next Friday. Thank you so much for being with us today. And thank you so much, Anagha, for doing this. Thank you so much, Devasmita. My pleasure.